This video is sponsored by Track Club. Get two months of music for your content free by using the link in the description. It's super easy to get all caught up in all the video production tips and tricks and hacks and gear that we all see everywhere. But if you really wanna make your videos better, the place to start is with the basics. So whether you're a beginner or if you're more advanced and you're just looking to revisit some of the fundamentals, what we're gonna do here is break down five crucial elements of video Video production that every video shooter should be working to learn thoroughly and within each element I'm gonna try and give you some actionable tips that you can start to implement right away so secure the cup and let's get into it the first thing that's important to understand when you're shooting video is something called frame rate. Video is essentially just a series of pictures called frames captured and played back at a certain rate. And it's measured in something called frames per second. Some of the most common frame rates are 24 frames per second, 30 frames per second, and 60 frames per second, although those are definitely not the only ones. 24 frames per second is known mostly as the frame rate used in cinema and movies, 30 frames per second is known for television and online productions, and 60 frames per second is known for action, sports, and gaming productions. Each of these frame rates have a distinct kind of look, and technically there's no right answer as to which one you should use, but there are two things that you should keep in mind when you're thinking about frame rate. First of all, there are capture frame rates and there are playback frame rates. The capture frame rate is set inside your camera and will be limited by your camera's specific capability. Then there is the playback frame rate, which is chosen in your editing software and it decides the frame rate that the final product will play back at. Generally, you want to set your editing timeline to whatever frame rate you want the final output to be and then also export at that same frame rate. And the second thing to keep in mind is which one you like the look of most for your project. And this is where you can have some fun. Go out there, shoot some test footage at different frame rates and see what you like the look of best. Personally, I find myself shooting mostly at 24 frames per second because I prefer the way that it looks. If you're planning to edit something at 24 or 30 frames per second, you may still want to shoot certain things at 60 frames per second or even more though, and that is for slow motion. If you shoot a video clip at 60 frames per second and play it back at 60 frames per second, the resulting image will look like normal real-time playback. However, if you shoot at 60 frames per second and then play it back at 24 frames per second, Second, it'll play back at 2.5 times slow motion compared to the way that it was shot. Now, it's important to note that in most editing software, if you drag a 60 frames per second shot into a 24 frames per second timeline, it won't automatically play back in slow motion. So you will have to figure out your own software's version of slowing down the clip to 40% speed, which is the same as 2.5 times slow motion. The next fundamental thing that we want to understand when shooting video is something common commonly referred to as the exposure triangle. But today, we're gonna to talk about the exposure pentagon. The exposure triangle refers to the three settings on your camera that you can change to either increase or decrease exposure. When I say exposure, what I'm talking about is how bright or dark the image is. These settings are shutter speed, also known as shutter angle in videography, and then we have aperture, also known as iris, and then we have ISO. ISO boosts the exposure of the image digitally which can be really handy if you need to make things brighter, but the more you boost it, the more noisy the image can get. So it's good practice to try and keep the ISO as low as you possibly can in your camera. Aperture adjusts the size of the hole in the lens, allowing light in. And the main point of it is to decide how much of the frame is in focus, but it also affects the amount of light that's being let into the camera. For example, a wide aperture with a small F number like F1.8 will have a blurrier background and at the same time, because the hole is wider, it'll make your image brighter. If you use an aperture like F11, the hole will be smaller and more of the image will be in focus and it will be darker than the F1.8 version. Then finally, we have shutter speed, which fundamentally adjusts the amount of motion blur in the movement of your images. The faster the shutter speed, the more frozen 
each frame will look and the darker the image will be. And the slower the shutter speed, the more motion blur will get in the image and the brighter the image will be. But shutter speed is kind of an interesting thing in the world of video because there's kind of a standard for where it should be set called the 180 degree shutter rule. This rule states that your shutter speed should be as close to double the frame rate as you can get it within your camera to get visually pleasing and natural looking motion blur. So if you're shooting at 24 frames per second, the shutter speed would be 1 48th of a second. Or if you're shooting at 60 frames per second, it would be 1 120th of a second. So it's important to remember that the faster your frame rate is, the faster your shutter speed needs to be and the darker your image will be. But now that we've covered the three settings known as the exposure triangle, why are they called the exposure triangle? And the answer to that is because they're all kind of connected in the equation that we do to try to get the proper exposure for our shots. If you're trying to get a certain look for your shot, you may have to choose which of these settings is the most important one and then use the other ones to compensate depending on the light. For example, I generally try to keep my shutter speed at that 180 degree shutter rule. So if it's too bright out, I may have to compensate by having a slightly narrower aperture to get the image a little bit darker, even though that changes how blurry my background is and maybe changes my vision of the shot. Or if you need the image to be brighter and your shutter speed is already at that 180 degree rule and your aperture is as wide as it gets, then you may have to bump up the ISO, even though that means a little bit more noise in your image. The exposure triangle is all about understanding the relationship between these three settings and knowing how and where you can compromise. But I promise I promised you that I would turn the exposure triangle into an exposure pentagon, so we need to add two more points here. So let's pretend that we're absolutely not willing to compromise our three exposure settings that we have so far. What do we do if things are too bright? That's where ND filters come in. These are literally pieces of glass that you put in front of your lens to make things darker going into the camera. And people refer to them as sunglasses for your camera and that's pretty dead on, but they come in all sorts of different strengths and options depending on what you need for your shot. And the final point on our exposure pentagon is what happens if we refuse to compromise the settings and things are too dark and that's where lighting comes in. If your image is too dark, add lights. Pretty obvious, right? Now I'm dumbing that down quite a bit. Lighting is a huge part of videography and understanding light will 100% make you a better videographer or filmmaker. It can shape and completely change the look of a scene, but for simplicity's sake, factored into our exposure equation, let's think of it as a tool that can allow us to keep our settings where we want them and still get the exposure that we want. Next on the list is everyone's favorite topic when talking about making videos videos, audio. Yes, I'm being sarcastic. We kind of have a tendency to forget how important audio is in our projects, but I want to keep this simple. So I really just want to talk about three different parts of audio that you should keep in mind. The first part is production sound, also referred to as location sound. This is any kind of sound that you record while you're filming. That could be ambient sounds. It could be capturing the sounds of the actions on screen, or it could be the dialogue of the person talking in front of the camera. And for all of these, I want to stress the importance of using a decent microphone and microphone placement. Regardless of your setup, I highly recommend using some kind of external microphone for your camera. And the general rule of thumb is to get that microphone as close to the source of the sound as you can while still maintaining your shot. The further the microphone is from whatever is making the sound, the more background noise is going to be in the audio. The second part of audio that I want you to focus on is using music to emphasize the feeling of a scene. Using different music can make a scene feel completely different. Let's take this quick 10 second sequence, for example, and I'll use the sponsor of this video, Track Club, to show you exactly what I'm talking about. So if we head over to Track Club, I'm gonna click on songs, and then under mood, I'll choose confident, and under genre, I'll choose rock. There are lots of other filters here too, but We'll just leave them for now. There's this great song called Hollyhock in here. So let's just download that and set it aside for now. Now, if we clear out all the filters again and start with a genre of folk and orchestral, maybe an energy of low medium, we've got this song called Red Fern. 
But real quick before we download it, I'm gonna open up a Track Club feature called Mix Lab that allows me to remix the stems of the song right on the website. I'm gonna mute the vocals because I just want the instrumental for now, and I'm going to turn up the guitars and down the strings a little bit because I wanna emphasize that nice folky guitar. Mix Lab allows you to take a song that might not normally actually be able to work in your project and remix it so that it can work. So let's take a look at our 10 second clip with the rock song first. And now with the folky orchestral track. You see what a huge difference that made for the vibe and the feeling of the video? So choosing the right music and great quality music can make a huge difference in your productions. And if you wanna give Track Club a try, use the link down in the description to get two months for free. I highly recommend it and I think you'll really love it. And the third piece of the audio puzzle is sound design. Here's another example of that same scene with no sound design. And now here's what happens if we add some sound effects in here to just enhance things a little bit. A lot of the sound design tutorials and videos that you see on YouTube walk through really complicated and complex sound design ideas. And don't get me wrong, they're fantastic and impressive, but with sound design, a little goes a long way. An ambience layer or two just to kind of get that background sound and then some specific sound effects to emphasize certain things that are happening on screen can make a huge difference. The next thing that we should probably be thinking about more when we're making our videos is composition. Composition, in short, is just where you put the camera in relation to everything else. There are a few things that you can be thinking about when you're trying to create pleasing compositions. First off, try to make sure that you get a variety of shots. Wide shots, medium shots, close-ups, etc. If you have all the same type of shot, it's gonna get really boring. Second, try to use the rule of thirds grid for framing. Most cameras have the ability to add the rule of thirds grid on their monitor, which is basically two horizontal lines and two vertical lines. And you can put things of interest on those lines or where the lines meet or even fully centered between the lines, but just kind of using that as a guide for your framing. Thirdly, try to change the height of the camera. Not only can this change the perspective that the viewer sees things from, but it also visually completes presses the mid-ground if you move lower. So if you've got a wide shot and you think that all the stuff in the middle is taking up a bit too much of the scene, move the camera down a bit and that'll remove some of the emphasis on the mid-ground. And lastly, if you have the ability, consider the focal length of your lens. Because of something called lens compression, the same shot can look very different on a 24 millimeter lens versus an 85 millimeter lens. And I saved the best for last, or at least I saved my favorite for last, and that is color grade. Just in case you don't know what color grading is, you can take a clip like this, and by adjusting the colors, light, contrast, and some other things, you can turn it into this. Now, the sexy part of color grading is the creative, stylistic part, but I would argue that maybe the more important part, especially for beginners, is something called color correction. Color correction is the part of color grading where you take whatever you shot in camera and you make it look, for lack of a better term, normal. Normal. So this is things like fixing the white balance, fixing the general exposure, the contrast, the saturation, just to get things looking reasonably normal to start with. Then, if you wanna take things to the next level, you can get into the creative side of color grading and start to add more of those stylistic things. You can use presets or LUTs, like the LUT packs that I have on my site to give you this part of things, or you can dig into all of the learning and the tools so that you can create custom looks for yourself. Not only does this just look cool and look better, give your video its own kind of style, but it also enhances the mood of the video as well. If things are dark and blue, 
it can feel cold and serious, or if things are bright and more orange, it can feel more warm and inviting. If you wanna help out your fellow filmmakers and add to this list of basics that we should all be learning and relearning, leave a comment down below and add to the list. And on your way down there, make sure to hit the like and subscribe button and the bell notification so you don't miss out on future videos. I will leave links to some other videos on some of these topics so you can dive in even further down in the description. Huge thank you to Track Club for sponsoring this video. They've got a link down in the description that gets you two months for free. So go check that out. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.